You can listen to The Professional Left wherever you get your podcast, on Netroots Radio, or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a PayPal button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for November 13th, 2020. It's not safe for work. Coming to you live from the Cornfield Resistance, where we're still holding our breath until all the votes from Fredonia are counted. It's the professional left with Drift Glass and Blue Gal. I don't think those Fredonia votes are going to make a difference, Drift Glass. Gotta count them all. All the votes. <laughs> all the votes. Fredonia. Unless, unless Trump is losing. Yeah. Unless Rufus T. Firefly is losing, then don't count the vote. Uh, well, he's retained the Firefly services as his attorney, I believe. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't that doesn't think- work. I mean, to, to me, mm-hmm. the two remarkable things that happened this week, the networks, the cable news networks cut away from Trump. Yeah. Jesus. That's huge. And his lying uh, little little uh, chihuahua. Yeah. Kayla McEnany. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm going to stand up here and tell you some lies. Oh, we're cutting away. Okay. Well, never mind. Yeah, that was, and, that was pretty and remarkable. one commenter said, you know, this is this is the Joe McCarthy moment. This yeah. is, no. oh, no, we're, we're done now. And, and to me, that is also an indication of how in, in good times with a, with a president that has a staff that knows how government works – it, whether they're whether they're e- for evil or good, but knows how government works. Mm-hmm. The apparatus of Washington D.C. turns toward the presidency. The power that is that is, and for good or ill, that can work for you. That can work for democracy or against democracy. But that's what kept Trump in power for four years. Oh yeah, and and <laughs> it really is the fact that there is an apparatus turning to him as holding the presidency and that power is hard we found out very hard to uh rest from someone's grasp even if they totally don't deserve it well we also saw that the the huge uh venn diagram almost perfect circle overlap between um institutional republicans and the right. mainstream media in that they will slowly move towards doing the right thing once it's completely safe and there's no risk whatsoever. To right, them. right. And once right. everyone else has taken the shots to their head, everyone else has mm-hmm. gotten bloody, everyone else has laid down the wire, everyone else has pushed and pushed and pushed as hard as they could, then along will come. And, and actually, um, of note, if you don't mind, as a little sure. aside, once upon a time, I read a bunch of Ayn Rand stuff. She wrote a novel called We the Living, which is sort of semi-autobiographical about her getting out of Russia during Stalin, the Stalinist era, and during the Russian Revolution. And there were two protagonists, two male heroes in the book, or I'm not sure if they're heroes, but one of them, one of them was a genuine committed communist who, during the war, would jump into the foxhole, risk his life to, to spread the good word of the revolution. And the other one was the weasel who would wait until the first guy had gotten shot or everything was safe and would come sleezing in behind everybody and say, oh, yeah, no, no, I was with you the whole time, man. I was there. Now, these are – neither of them are, you know, good men mm-hmm. as far as as far as far Ayn Rand is concerned. But one who's actually a principled person who is willing to take risks and risk his personal safety for his beliefs. And the other one was just a fucking opportunistic parasite. And, of course, mm-hmm. the opportunistic parasites always win because they wait until the good people bleed out doing all the hard work and then come sleezing in behind them saying, yeah, no, no, I was totally with you the whole time, man. Yeah, just give me that network contract and a couple of book deals and that's all I'm asking. And that's what I'm, that's what we're seeing here. We're seeing mm-hmm. people who mm-hmm. did the actual hard work of pushing hard on the Republican Party for years and years and years. Um, taking a backseat to the mainstream media coverage Mm -hmm. of now we're going to cut away from Donald Trump. That's a signal event. Yeah. Shouldn't have been. And we're going to use the word lie (laughs) in our coverage. Oh, gracious. Well, that is the second thing that is remarkable. Yeah. Uh, 
the the first thing is pulling away from Trump. And the second thing is just watching that apparatus turn away from Trump to Biden because Biden won the election. Yeah. And and those two things together, you know, Washington worked Mm -hmm. (laughs) for that for that. From that perspective, Washington worked. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and that does not mean I, – I guess that gives us some tools. Some And I get – here's what I want to say. I'm, delete all, I'm going to delete all that. No, 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 no. Just leave it in there because you're what – that, what that means is it's important to remember that the mainstream media is not your friend. No. And we're going to talk about that no. in an upcoming podcast. Yeah, very much not. We have a whole series planned for – Post-election university. <laughs> and we wrote it on cocktail napkins. And we did. Literally and- coffee coffee shop napkins mm-hmm. um, last weekend. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's talk – let's start with that. Let's start with the um, don't you dare call it Trumpism, which is lesson one. <laughs> lesson well, one this week. That's the, the – we're, we're asking our listeners to uh, – our, our, our eyes and ears in the world, you, you all out there – to take what we call the Blue Gal Challenge, mm-hmm. which is, um, as you all know, my charming and brilliant wife wrote a, a post for Crooks and Liars in August of 2015, if I'm not mistaken. 16. 2016. That's right. August, before he was elected, 2016. And, and uh, coming. I'm going to read it. I'm going to read it to you, oh, actually. I, I'm going to kick back. And this is this is how we spend our time at home, folks. Um, my wife reads me her posts. <laughs> I read, I read her mind. I wake her up at two in the morning. And go, guess what I wrote about David Brooks, honey? And then I get a uh-huh. pillow on the face. And, and I, I go, yeah, yeah, no. So, but please, <laughs> after you. Actually, he says, guess what David Brooks wrote today? And I said, uh, a eight hundred word post about humility and how we have to get along with Republicans and Republicans are really great. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah. Uh, oh, <laughs> fuck me. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, I wrote this in the summer of. 2016, before Donald Trump, the possibility of Donald Trump winning an election Mm -hmm. was discussed, and I did not think Donald Trump was going to win. I'm going to fess up to that. I Mm -hmm. didn't predict that. Um, But I I did notice this in the summer of 2016, and this fell right in with what we have been talking about on the podcast for since 2010. Yeah. So for six years, we've been talking about this. And so this this needed to be said about Trump before he was elected. Mm-hmm. Have you noticed a number of media outlets calling the Republican campaign for president Trumpism? Mm-hmm. And as I mentioned on last week's show, that the recurring mentions of Trumpism have exploded this week. Yeah, you track those. Right. I do track those. Mm-hmm. And it ha- it. You calling it Trumpism and what's going to happen to the Republican Party? Is it going to remain Trumpism or is it going to go back to being the Republican Party as if they are not the same thing? It isn't Trumpism. It's the Republican Party. And it has been the Republican Party for far longer than Donald Trump has been running for president. I showed a video in this post from July of 2015 in which CNN's Allison Camerota asks a focus group of Trump and leaning toward Trump voters why they like him. If you've ever watched any of these average Trump voter panels, you know their trademarks. He speaks his mind and says what I am already thinking. Illegals are the number one issue on my mind. Mm -hmm. He'll make America great again. The reason the news media puts these panels together is because these panels are made up of registered Republican primary voters. Mm -hmm. They didn't just register to vote this year or fall off a truck into the Republican Party. They voted for Bush twice. They voted for McCain-Palin. They voted for Romney. And they're tired of losing and being embarrassed by their votes so embarrassed that they fell for a Tea Party rebranding just so they would not have to associate themselves with George W. Bush. And then the Republican establishment had the nerve to suggest they vote for George W. Bush's brother. (laughs) And really, Jeb was the media's frontrunner in 2015, 2016. He He was was going to be the one. And then when he failed, it was going to be Rubio. Definitely going to be Rubio. Let's just definitely going to be Rubio. That's what 
That's what uh, David Brooks said. Many, many times. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump lies about a lot of things. But he is not lying when he says he received more Republican primary votes in the 2016 election than any other candidate in U.S. history. That statistic is skewed by how many Republicans voted for someone else other than Trump. But the fact that the race boiled down to Trump versus not Trump is not helpful to the Trumpism argument. It was Republican voters that selected Trump as their candidate in state after state after state. The Beltway News Media, remember, I wrote this in 2016. The mm-hmm. Beltway News Media is terrified that the Republican Party will be forever tarnished by this Trump candidacy. Why? Because Trump as Republican busts open their both sides myth that both sides of the political spectrum are equally bad, equally wrong and right, equally to be blamed for the mess in Washington. Both siderism protects the Beltway's need for an election horse race, as well as a view from nowhere in which the media is outside of the race altogether and just an observer of the process. Both siderism picks a side. And that side is the side that's willing to lie repeatedly to win elections and policy points. So if a Democrat says, let's try to pass the Affordable Care Act and give seniors access to end-of-life counseling and hospice care if they want it. Mm -hmm. And the entire Republican Party went, Obamacare is death panels. Mm -hmm. They want to kill grandma. Obama isn't a real American or a legitimate president. And the Beltway media said, both sides race to the bottom. Uh Uh-huh. Donald Trump is such an outlier on the lying and the pathological narcissism scale that it's easy to think, well, he's not really a typical Republican. But Trump won Republican primary after primary by appealing to Republican primary voters. And he did that by echoing what they were hearing on Fox News all the time. Mm Mm-hmm. And Trump is not an outlier on the insane rhetoric that has accompanied Republican talking points, particularly on immigration. Remember when Fred Thompson, during the 2008 presidential race, said, uh, we are now living in a nation that is beset by people who are suicidal maniacs and want to kill countless innocents. That was Fred Thompson. That wasn't Donald Trump. Now, now I just want to interject that it's no yeah. fair remembering things, but please, <laughs> please continue. Remember when Republican Representative Steve King said calves the size of cantaloupes, they're hauling 75 pounds of marijuana across the desert. All these children of illegal immigrants are all pot importers. And Mike Huckabee was at a Republican presidential debate suggesting that UPS and FedEx knew how to track packages. Why don't we outsource immigration to UPS and FedEx Mm -hmm. so they can label people? Let's not forget that Donald Trump is not even the first Republican whose judgment was called into question by U.S. generals for using rhetoric that harms national security. In 2009, I mean, there I go remembering shit again. Yeah. Yeah. Naughty, naughty. uh, A group of retired generals lambasted Liz Cheney and Vice President Dick Cheney for creating hysteria concerning the closing of the prison at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Mm Mm-hmm. Retired General David Maddox said, some of the fear issues that are being raised in this are really unfortunate. It gets people excited about things they shouldn't be excited about Mm -hmm. and impedes doing what is critical to this country. We take a setback internationally every time somebody, whether it's the former vice president or his daughter, comes out and says the things that they say. And you can see how that worked out. Guantanamo is still operating largely well, thanks to Dick Cheney. And, and a, a brief aside, um, when Dick Durbin, our Senator Dick Durbin, found out about the torture program mm-hmm. and, and said, this is not something U.S. soldiers should do. This is this is Nazi shit. This is Pol Pot stuff. Mm-hmm. There was a united freak out on the right that screamed, how dare you compare the noble military of Our the troops. greatest nation on earth yeah. to Nazis. And they flogged him into, into apologizing. Well, now we have, what, six years later, eight years later? Yep, they're Nazis, all right. The Republican yeah. Party are fascists through and through. And and everyone who called them on it 
before the never Trumpers decided to make it fashionable was treated to the same abuse, which was how dare you, how Mm -hmm. dare you even, even mention fascism in the same voice as the party of Lincoln, you sleazy terrorist loving scumbags. Yeah. They're better at messaging than we are. That's for sure. Well, no, um, we're, we're actually pretty good. We just can't get on TV with our messages. Yeah. Uh, yeah Charlie yeah. Sykes can get let on me, all let day me, long. Let me continue. Oh, let me please, continue. Please, please. yep. Uh, the rise of Trump is completely due to Republican leadership. Yay. And their insistence on their way or the highway on policy. Most appalling, the Republican establishment in the Congress, I'm looking at you, Mitch McConnell, built the expectations and attitudes of the Republican voter and then expected them to go along when those expectations couldn't possibly be met in real government action. As the most ignored yet most correct analysts of this problem, Ornstein and Mann have noted Mm -hmm. for over two years, and this is Ornstein and Mann, having worked to demonize the president is illegitimate, President Obama is illegitimate, and not loyal to America or American values, Every subsequent compromise made by GOP leaders to keep the government open or to pass policy was, by definition, working with the enemy. All these forces created a massive backlash against Republican Party leadership. In the end, the only two viable contenders for president were Ted Cruz, whose calling card was calling his own leader, Mitch McConnell, a liar on the Senate floor, and Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Pundits and scholars had seen the establishment play along with Glenn Beck-style radicalism and conspiracy-mongering before, only to engineer a nomination for a regular Republican leader. They assumed, and, you know, here again, we're talking about David Brooks, they assumed history would repeat itself with a Bush, Rubio, Kasich, or Walker. We did not. And here we come back to the Beltway media. The Beltway media wants to call it Trumpism so that after the election, they can go back to having Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan and uh, Jeb Bush and Marco Rubio on their Sunday shows at their book signings and their Georgetown cocktail parties. Mm -hmm. The village, as Digby has coined it, can go on pretending that it's not about right and wrong. It's about keeping their prestige and power. Yep. Uh, And at this point in the post, I put a picture of the cover of Washington Life magazine Mm -hmm. where Scott Brown and Mika and Joe are at a party together as the A-list. They're A-list party goers. Uh And uh, Tucker and Susie Carlson had a book signing party for Jack Abramoff at their house. Watch particularly for the Beltway media to question Hillary Clinton's mandate after the election. This is me writing in 2016 before the election, but you already see it today. No, Joe Biden doesn't have a mandate. He didn't he didn't win enough to have a mandate, even though he has exactly the same number of electoral votes that Donald Trump for Donald Trump in 2016 was a landslide. Well, and th- today, I mean, mm-hmm. uh, David Brooks's column, mm-hmm. which I, I will not go into in any depth because I already wrote about it. If you want to read about it, go to my blog is saying essentially, yeah, sure. You could listen to Elizabeth Warren and do a lot of stuff with executive orders to fix all the stuff that Donald Trump has destroyed with executive orders. But don't do that. Shove her out of the way. (laughs) Don't do that. You should definitely climb into the boat with uh, Mitt Romney because he represents uh, one person in the Republican Party. And (laughs) and then you could just, you know, rub your legs together and make little chirping sounds and something magical will happen. And eventually we'll have an infrastructure week. And and it's like. Unless David Brooks is punched in the face a million times, he is incapable of acknowledging what has happened to his party. And 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 that's the Trumpism part. Watch for the Beltway media to question Joe Biden's mandate after the election because Trump was such an outlier. Yep. He wasn't. He was what the Republican voter chose to represent them enthusiastically and overwhelmingly. Mm-hmm. It's not Trumpism. It's the Republican Party and the Republican establishment, and the Republican voter. They did build this. They built this. Yes, they did. Don't let the Beltway media enablers pretend otherwise. And on August 1st of 2016, the New York Times called them the stupid party. Anything to not call them Republicans. 
We cannot allow rebranding of what Donald Trump has done to happen. They are Republicans. Mm -hmm. And the bigotry and inhumanity and corruption is the Republican Party. And so the blue gal challenge, as Drift Glass has coined it, Mm -hmm. is to look for examples where people are talking about Trumpism. Mm -hmm. And on social media, remind them, go after them. We've we've seen our listeners and other people go very hard and and very well against both sides. Yes. You, You know, you hear that and like, okay, immediate reaction. People on Twitter get slammed for saying both sides. Yep. We want the same reaction from Trumpism. It's not Trumpism. Say Republican. Try saying Republican for a month and see how that sounds. It's not. And and you're right. The people at the bulwark love to say Trumpism. It's all they they do. Pretend this is Donald Trump's problem and that there's a separate and virtuous Republican Party out there. Mm -hmm. There is they have no base that that virtuous Republican Party is 12 guys at a Chardonnay sipping party in Georgetown. That's who they are. That's the good, good, you know, talking about marginal tax rates at yeah. some, well, right? I, as, as we were saying, you know, back in 2005, 2006, you know, years and years ago, during the Bush administration, uh, which I wrote about back then, it was if you, if you actually got rid of all of the bigots and the imbeciles and the homophobes and the xenophobes and the gun nuts and the evangelical science-hating boobs, the Republican Party would be a few thousand guys in ugly pants bitching about marginal tax rates. Right, That's it. Right. That that amalgam of human trash is the party. And the people who are now, you know, wringing their hands at the horror at Donald Trump has brainwashed the party or taken over the party or hijacked the party. No, you've been riding that party like a flea on the back of an elephant for mm-hmm. 40 years, pretending yeah. that you are actually running the show. And for a while you were like – you had sandworm hooks in it, and you could steer the elephant where you wanted it to go. That was what people like Rick Wilson did. And all of us down here in the grass being trampled were telling you, you are going to pay. You're going to make the rest of the nation pay. This will end in catastrophe. And now that it has, you are all calling it Trumpism. Isn't it Trumpy? The Trump voters, the Trump supporters. No, they're all fucking Republicans. Mm-hmm. And we're mm-hmm. asking you every time you see someone online – and. Sadly, a lot of our allies do this too. Yeah, yeah. Because they don't want yeah. to admit that, first of all, you know, douchebags like us in the middle of the Midwest were right. And <laughs> second, they don't want to piss off their new bestest buddies who have a lot of face time in the on Lincoln MSNBC, Project, right? who have a lot of money and are, ve- are very, very powerful in the media. And they don't want to hack them off just to support some, you know, nobody in the middle of a cornfield. But the fact is, it ain't Trumpism. It never was Trumpism. It's, it's not. And, and it hurts. It hurts political discourse to call it Trumpism and pretend, continue to pretend that there's this virtuous Republican Party out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, it There isn't. Um, I want to change gears completely for a moment, Drift Glass, before Please we do. go on to all the other stuff to talk about. Please because do. I was um, surveying uh, Donors Choose Today, which is one of my favorite charities, Yeah, uh, giving directly to classroom teachers. Huh? Um, and five bucks makes a difference. You know, if, you, if everybody pitches in five bucks to buy a teacher um, some materials that they need for their classroom, uh, and that need is not gone because of COVID and because of distance learning, if anything, it's increased. But um, I came across a classroom, and I'm, I'm not going to get into details about it, but the teacher was saying that, uh, and I'm always, by the way, I'm always looking for um, young classrooms where the students have autism because that's a passion of mine. My son had, was diagnosed with uh, language delays and ADHD and, and uh, a, a version of autism when he was three. And so I really believe in paying forward to all of the uh, public school yeah. teachers who yep. helped him mm-hmm. get to college and now he's a senior in college mm-hmm. and so for me this is paying it forward to give five bucks to a teacher when i can to help those teachers who are doing that kind of work that helped my son 20 years ago uh make a difference and so i'm looking at this teacher's uh request and she wants to buy crayons for her classroom now <laughs> You would think there would be a state budget for crayons, right? Yeah, no. no. No, there isn't. 
And she has to adjust her teaching because not only does she have distance learning now where she has to make sure that her impoverished students, she's a she's a Title I school, which means the majority of the students in that classroom are in poverty. Uh, she has to make sure they have crayons at home to use in, in learning. Uh, but when they come back, the COVID regulations are our kids can't share crayons. And so she's got little Ziploc bags set up so that each child gets their own Ziploc bag labeled with crayons in them. I remember teaching and be, and watching my son's classroom, and there was a bucket of crayons in the middle of a table. Yeah. And you picked from there. And now with COVID, if, if we go back to the classroom, first of all, getting preschoolers to wear a mask all day long is going to be impossible. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is something that our friend Tex Betsy has talked about a lot because she's a classroom teacher. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the idea that you're going to somehow manage COVID in the classroom is just simply not going to happen. You're going to have to have a vaccine and get past it, and then you can bring kids back in the classroom. That's it. Uh, but... It just, I I read this teacher's request and she's buying 800 crayons because she has multiple classrooms during the day that she walks from one to the other Mm -hmm. to set up for her, you know, 100 students that have autism in one school, which is not surprising. Um, She can't teach sharing and social skills with sharing crayons anymore. Um, You and I talk a lot when we're sitting in the living room about what's been taken away from our teenagers in terms of this is the time when they want to hang out at Taco Bell. Right. And they can't do that. But our kids are 16 and 18 and 22. Yeah. And they understand what COVID is and they understand what communicable disease is and why they have to wear a mask and why everything has to be clean at their, at the restaurant they work at. And these are children who are second grade and younger. And you have to explain to them why they're learning at a computer. And you can't teach them social skills six feet apart or on Zoom. Right. I mean, you, there are th- you can do turn-taking. There's things you can do. Mm-hmm. You can read them stories about turn-taking and sharing and so forth. But if a child's reality is and, and a child's attention is hard to keep in the classroom because they have ADHD mm-hmm. and all of a sudden they're on Zoom – I don't know how teachers do it. I just, I don't know. So what I want to say about this without crying is that this is World War III. Yeah. And the enemy, the Nazi enemy is COVID. Mm -hmm. And we, there's going to be disruptions and relocations and deprivations as a result of this, but we've got to treat this as a war. And that's when I say, hello, Hollywood. Hello. (laughs) Because, um, if you watch, and I love to watch movies that were made during World War II for yeah. Yeah. non-military audiences, where you see Sherlock Holmes with a um, gas rationing sticker on the car yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and walking along the sidewalk by 21B Baker Street and there are sandbags. Oh, and if you listen carefully in The Big Sleep, um, mm-hmm. there's all those points, you know, how you fix for red points. Right. You know, for meat. It, yeah, for right? meat. Right, and and right. It, it's it's just part of daily life. It's just how people live. They they right. all adapted to it, and they all found a way to live through it. And I do think that Joe Biden gets it in terms of when he takes office. He's already talked about wearing a mask as patriotic. Um, he's got to get Hollywood working on this. He's yes. got. We've got to get mass media. Uh, and and our governor. Pritzker has done a very good job with Mm -hmm. the advertising in Illinois of connecting wearing a mask to wearing a seatbelt. Yeah. Um, But we've got to treat this as a war that, and this war is hurting our kids and we've got to fight it to save our children's future. That's what we've got to do. And you can't ship the children of London off to Wales. No, to Scotland or Wales. No, No. because no, the virus is there too. So, um, so that, that's one thing is I do think, that Joe Biden is treating this as, you know, <laughs> meow, right? That's what Jimmy yeah. Carter said, the moral equivalent of war. This is a war. Uh, and it's a war against a virus, and we've got to win this war for our kids. And it's a war that um, we used to be really good at fighting. And I Ooh. think we can be good at fighting yeah. it again. I absolutely do We think we can get behind this 100%. And, but it's, go- it's also going to require shaming those who 
do not take it seriously. And yeah. that's where Hollywood comes in. And this still- is where this is where the Lincoln Project comes in. Frankly, they mm-hmm. would be good at making ads that shame people. They're good at that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the other thing that I think Joe Biden is doing that will help is um, he's got a first lady who's an educator. Yeah. And uh, he's going to have an education secretary who's an educator. And uh, I certainly hope that's going to make a difference for um, particularly for kids with special needs. I'm I'm looking forward to seeing how that unfolds as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I want to do a shout out. You're going to hate this drift glass. I'm going to do a shout out to Matthew Dowd. <laughs> um, I'm he sorry. did have one I, good tweet. I this just week. lost my connection there. I didn't hear what you just said. <laughs> I think my wife just lost I'm her mind. I'm going to say something so. nice about Matthew no, no, Dowd's no. tweet. Hey. <laughs> but it was a good tweet about uh, he thinks that uh, Reverend Warnock and John Ossoff should have a Lincoln Douglas style debate regarding who has the more corrupt opponent. <laughs> oh, no, I, I, hey. I, I, I have never said that the people in the media who are mm-hmm. the kings and queens and lords and ladies of both sides do it are yeah. stupid. No. They're no, not stupid. Yeah. They're in fact that is points against them. They fucking well know that it's not both sides. Exactly. But that's where exactly. the money was. That's what that's the, where the corporate yeah. line was. So you don't yep. go crossing you don't you don't talk shit about Mickey Mouse when you work at Disneyland. No, and that's but there's a what... very good ad out today mm-hmm. about Kelly Loeffler. And did you realize that she wrote off her $25 million private plane? So that means the taxpayers of Georgia paid for her $25 million Those... uh, private plane. She set up a shell company just like Trump does to buy a private plane for her and then wrote it off as a business expense. Those those Georgia taxpayers are so generous and nice. They're so <laughs> kind. They're so decent. And, then, are... and so this ad, I mean, this is a perfect ad showing her private plane, showing her getting off a private plane, showing her $10 million house, which would be an $80 million house, except it's in Georgia. Right. So, so yeah. yeah. So, um, I don't know how John Ossoff's campaign is going to do ads about Purdue's insider trading, but the idea that he did insider trading uh, based on his intel that he had about COVID right. in February, uh, it's a little more, um, a little less concrete than a private plane. It's a little harder to do, but um, really, they they should just travel around the state together or online. Oh, that'd be great. And just say, uh, no, my opponent is more corrupt than your opponent. Excuse me, ma'am. I believe you are incorrect. My opponent is much more corrupt than yours. No, sir. No, I must respectfully disagree. No, I think it's a, that's a wonderful idea. That's yeah, a wonderful it idea. It is a wonderful idea. Mm-hmm. All right. So uh, two big stories this week. Yeah. They're the same story. Yeah. Um, and one is very good news. As of this writing, Joe Biden is the president-elect of the United States, and Kamala Harris is the vice president-elect. Um, this morning, uh, Joe Biden had pretty much exactly 78 million votes and has been steadily growing by 100,000 votes a day for the last, I guess, week or so, which is pretty impressive. Um, and they have won more votes than any other ticket in American history mm-hmm. by a lot, by 10 million mm-hmm. votes. That's the good news. Now. Would you care to guess which candidate has had the second largest vote total in American history? That's Donald Trump. Yeah. And that's the bad news. Um, As we mentioned last week, the toxic real estate of the Republican Party is going to be with us for the rest of our lives. Because after four years of very public Republican treason and madness and mayhem and, and criminal disregard for the public health, which is the number one job of any president, the tune of a quarter million people dying and tens and uh, 10 million now um, who've gotten COVID. Um, 10 million more people lined up to vote for Trump in 2020 than lined up to vote for him in 2016. I, I would argue, though, Drift Glass, mm-hmm. that in one in one regard, that is good news. And that is that um, we have a way of voting now mm-hmm. that needs to be accepted as vote by mail. Sure. That's fine. And that is paper ballots and that is hand counting. And uh-huh. that is a victory for democracy. The- so I am hoping that like World War II brought a lot of technological changes to the United States and the and the Western world that that were improvements in our lives. Mm-hmm. Uh that this uh vote by mail and and having the expectation that you'll have a paper ballot that you can count uh is a victory. 
I, for I, all of us. I, I agree that uh, paper, hand counted paper ballot is a victory, which is a, mm-hmm. you might remember 10 years ago and people were saying, why can't I just stay home and vote on my phone? No. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> Go g- vote by mail, vote a month in advance, change the laws, which, you know, you have to do to actually let people start voting and start counting early so that we don't end up with this nonsense again. By the way, yeah, yeah. the reason the, the counts were late is because Republican legislatures in Republican states wrote the law that way. So if you want to yep. get mad at someone in Pennsylvania, take it up with the goddamn Republicans who run the state. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I, the process is fine. What is deeply disturbing to any sane person is that. Such a staggering number of our fellow citizens um, are out and proud fascists. Yep. Um, and there's no other word that fits what they are because they they this election there was no excuse. We didn't know. We never heard. We knew all we knew was a guy. I, was a I voted camp. for Donald Trump as a joke because right. I didn't think he was going to win, and there was no reason to think he was going to win. Yeah. Right. And this right. time we know that the Republican Party is an out and proud American fascist party and they've been growing an out and proud american fascist party in public for the last 40 years mm-hmm. and the mm-hmm. and the thing that i can't get over is how catastrophically every institution in this country except for the liberals frankly have failed mm-hmm. in in even acknowledging that this disaster was unfolding right in front of us this whole mm-hmm. time it was a joke they were just kidding rush limbaugh's an entertainer Glenn Beck's a kook. And all this time, this this group of very tired, usually broke, um, more and more angry and depressed people who are liberals were saying, no, you don't understand. This is very, very bad. This is growing and it's bad. And they've 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 gone mad. They're 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 not attached to reality at all anymore. They're completely detached from reality. They'll believe anything Fox News tells them. They're fucking zombies and they're coming to kill us all. And that was just crazy talk. Until it actually happened. Mm-hmm. And then, mm-hmm. unlike England in World War II, they didn't take the people like Winston Churchill, who told them this was coming and put them in charge. Instead, they put the people who had been fucking up all along and kept them in charge. That's yeah. why Joe Scarborough still has a show. That's why Nicole Wallace is on MSNBC and not Digby. Um, and here's the problem. The Republican Party did not spend the last 50 years building a political party. They, they built a doomsday machine. Mm-hmm. which runs mm-hmm. completely on autopilot now. There's nobody who can turn it aside. There's no one who can tell it to stop. It was designed to kill anything in its path and acquire power. And that's what it's doing. So the Republican Party is doing exactly what it was designed to do, which is mindlessly kill anything in its way and accumulate as much power as possible. And and the truth and reality and what you believe yesterday and uh, deficits and everything else is just bullshit. It's just, that's just shit that feeds the machine. Nobody in the party believes anything about anything. They believe in acquiring power and destroying what's directly in front of them. And that's all. And the reason this should frighten you is that right now to hold on to power, the Republican party is recreating chapter and verse, the Nazi stabbed in the back myth. The, um, I'm going to pronounce this thing correctly. The Dolstos, Legende, uh, or Legenden, I don't speak German, right in front <laughs> of our eyes, right in front of us. This is the legend of the stab in the back. And I'm going to read a little bit from Wikipedia um, with a few words changed because I don't like the way they write in Wikipedia. Um, <laughs> the stab in the back myth was an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory widely believed and spread around in right-wing circles in Germany after 1918. The belief was that the German army did not lose World War I on the battlefield I was instead betrayed by the civilians on the home front, especially Jews and the Republicans who overthrew the monarchy of the German Revolution in 1918-1919. Advocates denounced the German government leaders who signed the armistice on November 11th, Armistice Day, November 11th, just a couple of days ago, 1918, as the November criminals. Mm -hmm. Now, when Mm -hmm. Hitler and the Nazi Party came to power in 1933, they made the legend an integral part of the official history of the 1920s. The official history of the Nazi party was that they were stabbed in the back, which is exactly what the Republican party is doing right now. They portray the Weimar Republic as the work of the November criminals who stabbed the nation in the back and seized power while betraying it. The Nazi propaganda depicted Weimar as a morass of corrupt degeneracy, national humiliation, ruthless persecution, of the honest national opposition 
14 years of rule by Jews, Marxists, and see if this sounds familiar, cultural Bolsheviks, <laughs> which is a it's very socialism and communism. Well, that's, class. that's Rich Lowry. And you know, that, that's <laughs> Jonah Goldberg calling us uh, th- those, those Tommy names. Tuberville, U S um, Senator, Tommy Tuberville. And, and who had at last been swept away by the national socialist movement and the victory of the national revolution in 1933. We are watching in real time a fascist movement in this country lose temporarily mm-hmm. and and bind itself back together under the belief, and this is where the statistics come in. As of today, 70% of Republicans do not believe the election was free and fair, despite no evidence of fraud. And 86% of Republicans don't think Biden was legit- legitimately won the election, but can't actually point to any proof that any of this is true. And then you add to that the whole blood libel bullshit that comes from QAnon. Yes. And you get, you know, a quarter of the Republican Party literally believes that and a third aren't sure. Right. It could be. We're just asking the questions. We're just asking. So we are now entering in this country in a very real sense that time between World War I and World War II. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, It's not going to last. Let's let's, let's be clear. Uh Uh-huh. Uh, workers in West Virginia and the Rust Belt are hurting. Yes, they are. People in Germany were really hurting after World War One. Yes, they were. And the the difference between how the world handled Germany after World War One and the way the world handled Germany after World War Two mm-hmm. is night and day. And it was it we learned our lesson. We you don't punish to the extent that you hurt average people. Mm-hmm. Average people don't understand that. Ronald Reagan is the one that destroyed your job. No. He destroyed your union and he destroyed your job and moved your no. jobs overseas for money. They don't get that. They don't have any sense of, of actual history. Mm-hmm. And so they're suffering and their economic suffering, the fact they're not the coal jobs aren't coming back. That has nope. nothing to do with Democrats. That has to do with it not being profitable anymore. Well, your industry you know, is no longer profitable. As you know, yeah. uh, Barack Obama lost the Iraq war. <laughs> um, and, and cause the Great Recession, and yeah, and, yeah. and Mitch McConnell will sit on his ass for the next seventy days and do not a what goddamn was, thing. What was Obama during during nine eleven anyway? Yeah, we don't know. We and Vietnam he, too. I mean, was, come on. He was flying the twentieth plane. I heard. I mean, I I hear people say that. I don't know if it's true, yeah, but I don't know. It might be, it. I heard some people saying it. And so, so for yeah. the next for the next three months, um, Mitch McConnell will sit on his ass and do nothing, pass nothing, while businesses fail because there's no relief bill. And then once those businesses are broken, because the only way it's someone, Biden's fault is yep. Biden's fault. At January yeah. 20th, it'll become Biden's fault. It'll become Biden's disease. It'll become Biden's recession. And the same fuckers who flock to the Tea Party to pretend they never had anything to do with George Bush will flock to whatever the hell they're going to call themselves this time and say it's all Biden's fault. It's all mm-hmm. the Democrats mm-hmm. and the Biden's fault. And the fact that Mitch McConnell is a seditious traitor who brought this on them will be completely lost on them because to acknowledge that would have to, they'd have to acknowledge that they are the problem and they would mm-hmm. rather blow their fucking brains out than admit they are the villains here. And they're never going to do it. Never there. This is them till the day they die. So now what is the secret magic force that's holding this base together? Well, it turns out someone at the New York times finally turned on a goddamn radio. <laughs> and here's a tweet from the New York Times. Data from the highest rated radio shows before and after the election illustrates how right wing talk show hosts like Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity have been consumed by the same baseless theories that of election fraud that have preoccupied President Trump. Gee, surprise, chicken and egg surprise. on that one. Who knows? <laughs> and if I weren't sitting here with, in my virtual hand, a copy of the column in the New York Times from 1994 – explaining mm-hmm. that Rush Limbaugh was the guy the Republicans were celebrating as the guy who got them elected and told them no feminazis, no libtards, and never compromise with anybody on the left because they're all a bunch of communists and, the, the, and the, the media is the enemy of the people. That was the message a quarter century ago from this asshole. And mm-hmm. it was the message that Newt Gingrich carried inside the House of Representatives. And that infestation has been growing and, and incubating and poking its head out every now and then getting it angrier and bolder and more dangerous and more lethal and everyone who's supposed to stop it from happening call it out has has compromised with it has gone along mm-hmm. with it. this is why new gingrich was the number one guest on meet the press when david gregory was a host 
Mm-hmm. Because, you know, hey, why not put a disgraced, bomb-throwing, racist asshole on television over and over and over again? So when the shit finally fell apart in the Republican Party, when they finally elected an actual orange freak to the White House, and he began destroying everything in the country, did they put the liberals on television? No. Progressives? No. Who did they put on? They put on Rick Wilson and Charlie Sykes. Because okay. we, can't, we can't acknowledge that anything before 2016 ever happened. Right. And I'm going to stop you there because yep, I'm done. And I know you want to get to Illinois 13 versus Illinois 14 and the house races. I do. Uh, we are so grateful that Lauren Underwood uh, pulled out a win. She did. Uh, at the And, you know, really tight race mm-hmm. in Illinois 14. And uh, that is an R plus 10 district, I believe. Uh, R plus five. R plus five. Plus okay. Five. So she... An African American woman, Democrat, mm-hmm. won in Illinois 14. Held on to her seat. Held yep. on to her seat. Won re-election in an R plus five district in the, during this period. And and the reason I want to bring this up is in, with two different races in Illinois. The Illinois 13, which is Betsy which is Lundgren, our race. Right. versus Rodney right. Davis, which she lost, and the Illinois 14, which are not next to each other, but they are similar in a lot of ways, mm-hmm. is that maybe some lessons from the Midwest can filter out to our friends on the coast. So they will understand what it means to run in an R plus five district as opposed to a D plus 30 district. Right. Well, I I don't want to lecture anyone on the coast I don't about running locally, but that is the problem right now at the Democratic headquarters, it is. which is uh, they want to run a nationwide template for house races and right. you just can't do it. You can't do it. And, and it is the- it is Tip O'Neill's dictum that. All politics is local, mm-hmm. and you just can't run a radically and correct left platform right. that we all want. Absolutely, um, in a D plus, you know, in a D minus five. I'm going to oh. say it that way. Yeah. District, uh, and expect that you'll be able to carry that district. You won't because of the handle that Fox News has on that district. Right, and there's um, no. And the so, people in that district are not going to magically flip from Rush Limbaugh listeners to loyal Democrats by right. yelling They're not. Medicare They're for not. all of them. They're just not going to do it. I but wish if they you're would. there pounding the pavement and doing local issues and caring yeah. about the community and showing your showing yourself, uh, you can win. Well, and um, and the, well, the reason this came up in my mind was that on social media locally, um, there's this big push that. You know, there's all these – there's five Democrats who lost. And and you mm-hmm. know what they all have in common? None of them ran on Medicare for all. And, right. and that's, oh, and, yeah. And it's well. like, well, okay, that's a little bit like, you know, all, all heroin addicts uh, drank milk at one point. Well, yeah, that's technically true, but it has nothing to do with what really happened. That's, um, it doesn't have anything to do with what really happened. Yeah. Absolutely not. Uh, Absolutely Joe, not. Yeah. Uh, specifically, Joe Cunningham in South Carolina first and Colin Peterson in Minnesota seventh uh, – the reason they lost uh, was that they're running in R plus 10 and 12 districts. Right. And, yep. and they're being compared in social media to wonderful candidates like Ilan Omar and, and AOC and Ian Presley, who are all running in D24 or higher. Yeah. You can run as left as you want in a, in a ultraviolet <laughs> blue district. You can right. run as liberal as you want. I, I come from an extraordinarily liberal district in Chicago. Right. They, they, you can run. Jan Schakowsky. Jan Schakowsky on, can go and talk about pro-abortion stance all day all long. long. And she will get elected. <laughs> and they love her. And, yes. if you, and come 230 <laughs> miles south and she wouldn't win anything. No. And this no. is just the way it is. So we have these two districts in Illinois, um, 13 and 14. And they're really very similar. Um, our uh, uh, 14, which is Lauren Underwood's. Um, is uh, 89.9% urban, 10% rural. The population is 780,000. Median income is 92,000 plus. So it's richer than ours by a lot. That's the thing. That's the really yeah. important thing. Um, it's yeah. R plus five, but it's wealthier. Yeah. And it's better educated. And it's better less educated. Less farming. Yeah, less farming. And mm-hmm. meanwhile, um, Illinois 13 is is more rural by a lot, by like 10%. Yeah. Median income is $40,000 less. Yeah, see, that's and, us. That's and, that's. Yeah. And so we are poorer and more yep. rural and more Republican than they are. Yep. But uh, yep. our district is rated R plus three and yep. hers is R plus five. Yeah. And yeah. in yeah. and in her district, it went from 
Now, her district is most famous for electing Denny Hastert to the House of Representatives <laughs> for 20 years. That's yeah. how Republican it is. And it's been going back and yeah. forth and back and forth. But she won uh, by a lot in 2018 and by a little bit this over time. Healthcare. Over health care. Over health care. And, and that's because it, re- it really was Obamacare being physically threatened during by a Republican Congress. Yeah. Um, it's, and it, it's a little harder to fire up the, the electorate over a Supreme Court case. Mm-hmm. I, I, I will just say that. The Supreme Court case right now on Obamacare is making activists really nervous. Um, we had the oral arguments this week on ACA, and the activists that I talked to were beside themselves that this is even happening. Um, you know, it looks it looks good. You know, <laughs> hopefully Nancy Pelosi and Joe Biden together, and hopefully a Democratic Senate by the hair of its teeth uh, can just change the law and make this go away. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's not the same as 2018, where no. No. people really thought their Obamacare was going to be taken away, and that was the only issue uh, in the midterms. There was no there that, was no president at the top of the ticket. Um, right. In right. 2018, right. the total vote count in uh, Illinois 14 was 297,000, uh, mm-hmm. 298,000. Mm-hmm. This year, it was 392,000. Right. It well, went- and the other thing is, too, when you talk about these R plus three or D plus seven, you're talking mm-hmm. about registered voters. Yes. And yep. we have a lot of registered voters in our district who are college students. Mm-hmm. And whether they turn out or not, can make a huge difference in terms of whether we get a Democratic House member or not. And in, um, in this election, yeah. our you know Betsy Dirksen Lonergan beat her um, total by sixteen thousand votes and last, still didn't win. And yeah. and Rodney Davis upped his by forty three thousand votes. Yeah, yeah. And that's yeah. the oh, that that seventy one million fascist assholes who came out and voted for Donald Trump are not equally distributed across the country. Right. They're in <laughs> surprise, surprise. They're in R plus five districts, yeah, and they right. came out in huge numbers to protect what they already have. So, yeah. it, and and um, Lauren Underwood w- uh, is winning. I'm not sure if they called it, yet, but is winning by a whisker, by a few thousand votes. So it's not that. And and if they had run, um, if they had run a Medicare for all, let's celebrate socialism campaign in either of these districts, they would have gotten slaughtered. Period. Yeah. That's just that's just the fact. Now, okay. if you look at her issues, her issues are exactly the issues she ran on health care, on veterans care, uh, infrastructure, all the stuff that I like. And and you can and you can see that and she's extremely good at uh, constituent service and very personable and so forth. But she ran on the issues that were of, of importance to people in her district. And you and we just have to get used to the fact that we are a very big party. And and I'll cover a huge spectrum of opinions, and we shouldn't be because there should be two parties. And one should be the Hillary Clinton party, and one should be the Bernie Sanders party. But we're not, so we're all under the same umbrella. And the way we win individually in our districts is going to be very, very different yeah. from district to district and state to state. And we and can't, DCCC needs to get used to that, yes, and not have a one size fits all platform. That if you take DCCC money, you have to run a a, a Cookie cutter Democratic campaign. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, let's go to the news, shall we? Okay. Um, here's some good news. This is very good news. And this this runs directly contradictory to everything I just said. It, was so, it makes me look stupid. And I like that. <laughs> uh, Joe Biden has named longtime aide Ron Klain to his White House chief of staff. And you know who thinks that's a great idea, Blue Gal? AOC. Yep. AOC thinks that's a terrific idea. She said Thursday that President-elect Joe Biden's decision to tap Ron Klain as his chief of staff is, quote, encouraging for liberals – the congresswoman, who's one of the most prominent progressive Democrats, described Klain, uh, whose appointment was announced today before, as a listener and a profoundly unifying pick. I think he's is extraordinarily competent. He led our country through the Ebola crisis. He's led us through many different political crises, she said. Um, and she's highly approving of Joe Biden's pick for chief of staff, which is Okay, awesome. but all of this makes me think of your ex-wife and uh-huh. how uh, when... When it's George W. Bush not giving you oh, yeah. money for oh, no, no. food programs, we we understand that because we hate Bush. But right. if if Bill Clinton doesn't give us a hundred percent of one hundred and twenty percent of what we want, yeah, in terms of food programs, Burn he's the devil, right? Burn it down. And I already see that happening mm-hmm. on YouTube with certain YouTube 
podcasters, liberal podcasters. Oh, I know. Reading a Politico article about who might be on Joe Biden's cabinet. Hey, I got sent <laughs> I got sent a YouTube video from a guy whose last name rhymes with door. Um, yeah. And that's it was the like, one. well, okay, you're a, you're a, I, I've watched this guy go off the deep end. No. And, and I'm going to say something. I love Jimmy Dore. Jimmy Dore is very entertaining to watch. Uh-huh. And he knows how to put together a 13-minute show. He does. But and, he, and good on him finding content to put together a 13-minute show on an article on Politico about who might be in Joe Biden's cabinet. Sure, sure. <laughs> but as I wrote back to the listener who sent that to us, I don't believe a fucking word of what Politico says. No. <laughs> Period. No. But, I mean, good on Jimmy Dore for finding content to talk about. And here's this, here's this possible cabinet and who we like and we don't like. Um, you're not going to hear that kind of... Uh, Reading aloud a political article about who might be on Joe Biden's cabinet, that we're not going to do that here. We've got a lot of other things to talk about. And yet, Chris Saliza believes <laughs> his hot take, who, um, multi multi millionaire, highly paid Chris Saliza, his hot take on the 2020 election is did it prove that liberals can't win? Did it prove that liberals can't win? Yes, it yeah. did, Chris. You got, you nailed it. Nailed it. What can I say? <laughs> You're right. China has congratulated Joe Biden on being elected president, saying we respect the choice of the American people. Yeah. Uh, In defiance of David Brooks's advice, Joe Biden plans to sign a series of executive orders after being sworn into office on January 20th to reverse Trump's policies, including rejoining the Paris Climate Accord, reversing the country's withdrawal from the World Health Organization, repealing the ban on travel from some Muslim majority countries, and reinstating the program that allows dreamers to remain in the country. Sorry, David. And it, it, I do recommend that people go over to buildbackbetter.com or gov or whatever it is. I think it's uh-huh. com because I don't think that the GSA has given them the right to use gov yet. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Um, but uh, if you look at, at the five areas where in, which start with COVID and continue with COVID and continue with COVID and continue yeah. with COVID, and then we're going to do these other things. Um, the section on racial justice and, and getting rid of systemic racism is really strong. And I just think that uh, you should go and take a look at what the Biden administration actually says they're going to do mm-hmm. and hold them accountable for it. I mean, yeah. that's the thing. Uh, this could be a lot of talk on a website. Um, they have lofty goals, and let's hold them accountable for trying to get those through. I'm not saying they're going to get everything they want. Uh, I certainly am going to hold Mitch McConnell uh, <laughs> accountable for blocking everything, which I predict he will do. Uh, and but, the, first, uh, the first three months has to be all COVID all the time. Yeah, yeah. Because without and you that don't solve same, that, same else. as it was with with Obama cleaning yep. up the mess that was left by the last. Republican president. Again, no fair remembering stuff, Blue Gal. Uh-huh. Um, the Justice Department's top election crimes prosecutor resigned in protest after Bill Barr authorized U.S. attorneys to probe alleged elections fraud. Uh, this is something I've been through before, but not with the White House. The White House continues to vet political appointees for Donald Trump's non-existent second term. Trump has removed Michael Cooperberg, the official in charge of the program that produces the federal government's scientific report on climate change. Yeah. Uh, the number of migrant children who are separated from their parents and whose parents cannot be found has risen from 545 to 666 migrant children. There does seem to be a fire sale going on. The White House forced two senior Department of Homeland Security officials to resign. Trump named three stooges to top Pentagon jobs a day after firing Defense Secretary Mark Esper. And some people think Trump is gearing up to start a war, while others believe he is using the U.S. intelligence services and the military services in the same way Trump's crony David Pecker used the National Enquirer to mine for secrets he can politicize or use to blackmail political opponents. And today in COVID news, because that's the most important thing going on right now, Dr. Anthony Fauci urged Americans to double down on precautions in the United States, recording more than 145,000 coronavirus cases on Wednesday, which is yet another record. Corey Lewandowski tested positive for the coronavirus. Womp, womp. Womp, womp. Representative Don Young, the 87-year-old, 87 years young, let's say, blue gal, uh, Alaska congressman who once ridiculed the seriousness of the virus, calling it the beer virus, said on Tuesday he is now infected with it. So womp, womp. 
The Washington Post reports that more than 130 Secret Service officers are said to be infected with the coronavirus or quarantining in wake of the Trump's campaign blitz. Uh, Donald Trump has told friends that he wants to start a digital media company to, quote, wreck Fox News. Bad news. It's already been done, Donald. It's called Pornhub. <laughs> <laughs> the Pennsylvania postal worker who claimed to have witnessed voter fraud admitted that he fabricated the allegations that a postmaster instructed postal workers to backdate ballots mailed after Election Day. Richard Hopkins told the investigators from the U.S. Postal Service's Office of Inspector General that the allegations of widespread voting irregularities were not true, and he signed an affidavit recanting his claims. Mm -hmm. This is another uh, Project Veritas paid person paid to lie. Yeah, yeah. And you can just pretty much, all Republicans are bad people. And Um, then there's some local news. There is uh, some, some very unfortunate local news. Uh, The Springfield metropolitan area where we live, where the cornfield resistance lives, is one of the regions experiencing the fastest growth of COVID-19 in the United States. According to data compiled by the New York Times, COVID-19 cases in the Springfield region, which encompasses Sangamon and Menard counties, are growing at the 11th fastest pace in the country. Jesus. It's scary. And it's just scary. I had to... I had the occasion to drive um, our old beater around to to sort of get its battery back up to speed because we had a little car work done. In advance of a trip, we're not going to (laughs) take. In advance of a trip, we're not going to take after all. No, 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 because we're not crazy. Um, But I drove downtown and I could peek, you know, as I drove real slow, peek through windows and there were people crowded around bars. There were people out in public together who shouldn't have been. There were restaurants where it was darkened, but there were clearly people inside. And there really is this kind of fuck you – and local leadership, the mayor and his corporate council, uh, have really failed this town mm-hmm. because they they mm-hmm. have the, the, the governor has said this is serious, this is really serious. Look at the numbers; we're going to have to close things down again. What the hell about stop it, stop doing this and mask up, you assholes? Don't you understand? And our mayor wants to straddle this shit. Yeah. Wants to say, well, you know, it's bad, but you know, what can I do? So it's it's a well, failure. He, of leadership. he wants to stop the the virus without disappointing the chamber of commerce. Right. Right. And I understand people are on, I believe me, I understand. I I worked with many, many hundreds of local businesses. I do understand, but it is, there's no way to save the local economy until you stop the virus. There just isn't. And it just, it's, you know, this is, this is, we're generation and a half. local business people either didn't vote or they voted Republican. Yeah. I mean, I really believe that. And, and, and they don't get it that with, with Mitch McConnell running the Senate, mm-hmm. you're not going to get help. No. And, you're and I don't up, know why they don't get that. Well, because they watch Fox News and they listen to Rush Limbaugh and their, yeah. their and brains that's the are, news are for mush. Them. Yeah. And you can't reason with them and you can't I, talk I hate to, to end on such a sour note, Drift Class. I know. <laughs> this well, is war. This is war mm-hmm. against a virus. It is. Uh, that's fists in the air. Mm-hmm. Let's let's fight this thing. And masks on the face, baby. And masks on the face. And I love you. I love you, too. <sighs> Each week we post to our Facebook page and website an internet kitty sent in by you, the listeners. But this week's internet kitty is actually a dog. What? And it's a dog sitting in a bathtub. What? Gizmo. We love Gizmo. Gizmo is sitting down in the tub very comfortably. And I remember when our old dog, when I was in high school, Jethro, Mm -hmm. when we got Jethro to sit down in the tub, that was always a sign that the temperature was right and he felt good and it was okay to be in there. And so it's so good to see Gizmo sitting in the tub. Gizmo is a seven-year-old Catahoula leopard dog mix. He's a big fan of the podcast, and he's a fan of freshly poured or basically any food. (laughs) Human food, pet food, freshly poured. He likes to eat. Mm -hmm. Whether you serve pet store perfection or dollar store dreck, your pet will sit on the kitchen floor and demand that the food they eat is only freshly poured. Freshly poured, freshly poured. Oh, my Lord, it's freshly poured. And you can visit Gizmo at our Facebook page or website. And you can send your Internet Kitty or other pet to us at our email address, proleftpodcast at gmail.com, or you can also write to both of us. Feel free to write to us. We love hearing from you. Be aware that if you write us at any of our addresses, we reserve the right to read your email or U.S. Postal Service 
Go Postal Unions! Let her on the air unless you say otherwise. We look forward to you having better support from the federal government that you deserve, Postal Service Unions. You betcha. You betcha. Hashtag save the post office. Don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline. If you can afford to buy an espresso-based beverage for yourself, buy one for us. This is not charity. This is our job and a labor of love. Approximately 1% of our listeners support this podcast with a contribution, and you can too. See our website, proleftpod.com, for details. Both our PayPal and postal address information is there at proleftpod.com. Please share our show on social media, and thank you so much for doing that. Hey, Drift Glass, how are the Internet Kitties doing this week? Well, Blue Gal, the Internet Kitties haven't heard Trump's voice in a week and wonder, is this what heaven sounds like? Let's think about living. Let's think about loving. Let's think about the hooping and the hopping and the bopping and the loving, loving, dubbing. Let's forget about the whining and the crying and the shooting and the dying and the fellow with a switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. The Professional Left Podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2019-2020, DGBG Productions.